so very warm welcome to everybody from a, around the world uh, for the launch of this report. It's called 2023, a watershed year for action on deforestation. So my name is David Shukman, I'm your moderator. And for many years, I was a correspondent for BBC News and most recently science editor. And over the years, I've, I've made a number of trips to rainforest nations to report on deforestation. And I mean, I'll be honest, I mean, some of the sites I've seen have been really heartbreaking. It's noisy, dark, vibrant forest is cleared for pretty silent monoculture. And, and it's very, very striking and painful to see that. So I'm very keen to support this endeavor and to step into the role of moderator. Just while, uh, before we actually get into the meat of the session, a little bit of housekeeping, we've got 45 minutes. We're gonna get a presentation on the findings uh, of the new report and then have a bit of a discussion with a panel. Uh, the focus of course is on what companies and financial institutions are doing or not doing about uh, deforestation, but there's also a heavy emphasis on looking forward to the potential for this year to be that watershed and what needs to happen to, to make that so. There will be time for your questions. You kind of know the drill, I'm sure, after countless webinars over recent years, but put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll endeavor to get to them during the course of the session. And just to say that the webinar is being recorded and will be shared uh, with you afterwards. We've now gone over 200 participants, so you're all very, very welcome indeed. So let me just um, move things straight on to, as it were, the, the kind of prime focus of this. I, I mentioned that the focus really is on, on the, the companies, the 500 companies and financial institutions, most of them banks, that are most exposed to the risk of triggering or fueling deforestation. And uh, so it's a, it's a vital time for their record to be examined, for them to be held accountable. Now the Forest 500 program, this annual set of reports, we're on the ninth of these, is a project of Global Canopy. And uh, I'm glad to say Nikki Mardas is with us. He's executive director of Global Canopy. And Nikki, I think you're gonna kick us off with really the, not, perhaps not the findings of the report, but the context for it, why it matters and, and what makes this year so crucial. So Nikki, over to you. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, David. Thank you to everyone for being with us today. I'm Nikki uh, Madas uh, from Global Canopy, as David has said. And look, let's go into Forest 500. It's in its ninth year this year. So it was launched, to give you some context, alongside the Paris Climate Agreement of 2015. And at the same time, there was the New York Declaration of for on Forests, many of you will remember, full of promises to get rid of deforestation from supply chains, from finance by 2020. So let's look back on those nine years since 2015, very briefly. Forest 500, we think, has played a vital role in upholding transparency, accountability for these market drivers of the commodities driving the great majority of deforestation worldwide. And we've created, uh, the team has created a framework that also helps guard against greenwash because it's a very comprehensive scoring framework, assessment framework that has been iterated year on year. So it's very hard to, you, I mean, you can't really game, game the system. So, so we're, we're proud of that contribution. But to be honest, over these nine years, it's often been a frustrating exercise. We've seen little progress. And some years, the key messages could sort of write themselves before the report even came out, you know, before the data was there. Big group of laggards who are lagging in the, among these 500. A small group of front runners doing, you know, great work, some innovating, fantastic. But overall, I mean, slow, slow progress must try harder seem to be the message every year. And then in 2021, a couple of years ago, we came through with a set of clear recommendations of the evidence of the last seven years to say, you know, well, let's take the context in 2021. The New York Declaration's goals on deforestation, market-driven deforestation, commodity-driven deforestation had been spectacularly missed. We had had seven years of private sector apathy, frankly, on deforestation. And the Amazon itself was on fire in a way that many had not seen 
before. And there was an assault on indigenous and local communities, not just from the usual suspects, but from the federal government itself. And you had scientists saying we're reaching a tipping point in this greatest and bellwether of all forests, the Amazon. So our conclusion then was that voluntary action by the market is very important. It moves the market forward, but we will never get sector-wide change, the, the change we need without legislation, without regulatory measures to make sure that you can't just hide among the pack. So now, 2020. Three, the ninth year. Well, it's not just a business as usual report. As David has, has said, this is an inflection point. It's difficult. The findings are still challenging, but there's much more cause for hope. And I just want to give three big pieces of context in that regard. The first is that legislation that we had seen to be so necessary. And just over a year ago, many of you will remember in Glasgow, COP26, heads of state for the first time, almost all heads of state actually stood up and said, and signing up and deforestation by 2030. So we had that high level political buy-in, but would it translate into action or would it be another 2020 scenario? And the vital difference this time is we have started to see a translation to real laws with real teeth in real jurisdictions. So the EU, the world's biggest market now has due diligence legislation on deforestation coming onto the books. I think it takes effect in the beginning of 2024, <laughs> same in the UK. You know, we, we don't have finance yet included under those laws, but that's going to be explicitly reviewed in two years for the EU. So that's a big thing, really big thing. Maybe we'll see an uptick next year as a result. Number two, nature has arrived. So Montreal, COP, COP15, we saw a global biodiversity framework agreed, a momentous moment, really. It could have been maybe stronger in some ways, of course, that's always the case case but an agreement was made by countries on nature the nature crisis like the paris climate agreement for nature so we'll hear more on that from ava zabi who played a key role which we're very grateful for in bringing business to the table and saying we need this agreement and a key question for ava and a key question for all of us is going to be how will that now translate like for climate how will the nature high level agreement translate into laws on the ground. There's already a couple on the books because deforestation has 80% of terrestrial biodiversity. So good for climate, good for nature. And then the third critical issue, people, the rights and indig of indigenous and local communities, including the fundamental right to play a key role in all of these big negotiations we're talking about is at last, slowly, but at last being substantively recognized. Of course, much more needs to be done. We will hear from Emil on this. And also from Emma on how the Forest 500 is evolving to ensure that action on deforestation by the market is understood to be inseparable from action on human rights. So hopefully those are some useful context <laughs> setters. And I, I just want to end with a quick observation, because when I looked at this year's results, I, it was striking to me. One of the stats that sort of jumped out was that we've seen a five-fold increase over the last three years among the 500 most exposed to deforestation, a five-fold increase in net zero commitments. Okay, great. And in Montreal, many of the same companies standing up saying we need a deal for nature. Great. But then why we're on deforestation when climate, nature, and people meet, why are we seeing so little practical progress, especially when the data, the guidance, the case studies, the tools, 80-20 there. We know that you can take action. So why are we not seeing more action on this critical, critical piece of the puzzle? And to the 40% who this report shows have no public position at all on deforestation while having this very high exposure, you know, to the VW groups, to the Diekmans, to the world's three of the world's four biggest investors who still don't have a position, you know, we say, are you serious? Are you, are you really serious? Follow your peers who are outperforming you, prepare for the legal change, and please take action for us all before it's too late. So, David, thank you, and over Nikki, to you. Well, that's, that's an incredibly clear introduction, and uh, I think, you know, we, we are at a stage where time is so short now, and the issues are so critical that, that kind of bluntness, the kind of bluntness you've just uh, displayed is, is, is kind of what's needed. Um, just as a quick thing before we move on to the panel, great to see... Um, participants from Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, the Netherlands, you're all very, very welcome indeed to this session. So the panel next, let me just introduce 
Emma Thompson, who is the Forest 500 lead from Global Canopy. She's going to take us through the main findings of the report in just a second. Then we also introduced Emil, um, Nikki just mentioned, Siren Gualinga, who's a sustainable finance consultant and also a member of the Quechua people of uh, Sarayaku in the Ecuadorian Amazon, and Eva Zabi, who is the executive director of Business for Nature, aiming to unify the business voice to reverse nature loss. Emma, let's, let's come to you first. I think you're going to take us through first the findings on the 350 companies uh, that are, I guess, buying commodities from rainforest nations, put themselves therefore at greatest risk of uh, fueling deforestation. So, so Emma, over to you. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for joining us. To take a small step back, I think it's really important to restate that the companies and financial institutions in the Forest 500 have the ability to transform global supply chains because of their exposure, because of their influence through that exposure but still far too many of the 500 we assess are not acting on deforestation or the associated human rights abuses. So as Nikki said, this is our ninth year of the Forest 500 and still 40% of the companies and financial institutions we assess still don't have a single deforestation commitment. But to answer your question and to focus on the companies, Global Canopy assesses 350 companies in the Forest 500. And these are the companies that produce or buy the greatest volumes of beef, leather, soy, palm oil, timber, and pulp and paper. And through their exposure to those commodities, they have a huge amount of influence to transform their supply chains. And we need to see these companies act on deforestation. And we need to see them act now. If I could have the slide, please. Thank you. So, this year, we found that 241 of the companies had a deforestation commitment for at least one of the highest risk commodities that they're exposed to through their supply chains. And 100 of those 241 have a deforestation commitment for all of the highest risk commodities that they're exposed to. So we have seen some examples of progress with some companies setting new commitments over the past 12 months. But if we go to the next slide, please. So critically, we found that 31%, so almost a third of the companies with the most influence on tropical deforestation, still haven't set a single deforestation policy. We are now several years on from the original global goal to eliminate deforestation by 2020 as part of the New York Declaration on Forests, and we're rapidly approaching the implementation of new EU due diligence legislation. And it's shocking that a third of the companies are still lagging so far behind. Deforestation needed to be eliminated by 2020, as I said, but as we know, that unfortunately wasn't achieved. But the goalposts can't continue to be shifted, and we need to see deforestation, conversion, and the associated human rights abuses eliminated by 2025 at the latest. 55% of the total 350 companies that we assess have set a deforestation commitment with a target date of 2025 or earlier, for at least one of their commodities. But then when we focus in on that group even further, just 16% of those 350 companies had a 2025 or earlier target date for all of the commodities that we're exposed to. We're only two years away from 2025, and so there's still a lot of progress to be made. And one final point that I wanted to focus on for companies was the action on human rights abuses that are associated with deforestation. Deforestation is frequently associated with or preceded by human rights abuses, including failure to respect customary rights to land resources and territory of indigenous peoples and local communities, and threats and violence against forest, land, and human rights defenders. So this year, we added indicators to our Forest 500 methodology on these two issues. And as you can see on the slide, a third of the companies with the greatest exposure to tropical deforestation risk don't have a single commitment on human rights that are most associated with deforestation. What we also saw is that through that strengthening of our methodology on these human rights issues, is that on average companies' scores for human rights fell by seven percentage points over that 12 month period. 
So not only are a third of companies not setting policies on the associated human rights, but even those with policies aren't keeping up with the best practice. Thank you. That's very clear. So that's the, that's the 350 companies. Um, Emma, let's turn now to the people financing them, the organizations, the banks and other institutions that uh, are pro providing the cash. Um, talk us through your findings on those 150. As you said, we do also assess the 150 institutions that are providing the most finance to the 350 companies that I just talked about, specifically through shareholdings, bond holdings, and loans and underwritings. If I could have the next slide, please, that would be great. Thank you. In 2022, these financial institutions were providing $6.1 trillion in finance to the Forest 500 companies. That's $6.1 trillion of finance into the companies most at risk of driving tropical deforestation through their supply chains. And when we focus in on their performance on deforestation and associated human rights abuses, if I could have the next slide, please. 61% of the institutions don't have a single public deforestation policy for any of the highest forest risk commodities, which means more than half of those trillions, that's 6.1 trillion, is not covered by a deforestation policy. Next slide, please. Just 39% or 58 of the financial institutions that we assess have at least one deforestation policy that they apply to their financing activities. And with the next slide, please, just 11% or 16 financial institutions have a policy in place for all four highest risk commodities, which is a slight increase in last year, so what that means is there are some positive examples of institutions that have really made significant progress even over the past 12 months, and some of which are pulled out as case studies in the report. But what's really clear from our ninth Forest 500 assessments is that the majority are still not making the progress we need, and they're not making it quick enough. If I could have my next and final slide, please. Thank you. And I just want to, again, take a moment to focus on the human rights abuses that are associated with deforestation and conversion of natural <laughs> ecosystems. So we also added new indicators to mirror the new indicators in our company methodology. So again, looking at customary rights to land, resources and territory and adopting a zero tolerance approach for violence and threats against forest, land and human rights defenders. And as you can see on the screen, just nine of the financial institutions included in the Forest 500 had, so that's nine, that are providing the most finance to the companies with the highest exposure to deforestation risk, have a policy asking their clients, holdings and companies to respect customary rights to land, resources and territory. And I think there's one more number to come up, please. Okay, we're, we're running out of time here, Emma. Do, I am. Is, it a, is it an important last slide? It is. It's this one. It's on, okay. it's on the screen already. So it's just two of the 150 <clears throat> have a zero tolerance approach for violence and threats against forest land and human rights defenders. Brilliant. Deforestation well, can only be eliminated by human rights abuses. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for taking us through that so so clearly. And again, apologies for the missing slides early on, and I'm sure we can find a way of sharing those those later. And we, that was both you, Emma, and and before you, Nikki, mentioned the importance of indigenous peoples in in this whole process as as, as victims of deforestation and uh, potentially in a sane world as guardians of the forest. And I've seen that for myself in the Amazon, just how regularly there are incursions by all kinds of different interests into indigenous uh, lands. Uh, Emil, it would be great to hear your take now on that from your uh, knowledge and, and background and experience. What, what kind of situation are indigenous communities facing and particularly how you relate it to the kind of stats you're hearing from this report? Yes, um, thank you, David, and thank you, Global Canopy, for inviting me um, to speak at this event. So I'll share my experiences, um, both as a member of the Kichwa people of uh, Sariaco in the Kodern Amazon, as well as a sustainable finance consultant, uh, and my experience working with companies and financial institutions. And I think my uh, the experience of my community, Sariaco, um, it's a unique situation. Um, Every community faces different situations, so I can speak for all indigenous peoples, but I think it's reflective of the experience of other communities as well. <clears throat> so as far as I can, as far as for as long as I can remember, it has been a full-time job for many of the community members. 
uh, to defend our territories um, against, well, to protect our territories and rights, basically. And at, at certain periods, it has been a full-time job of everybody in the community, and this includes children and elders as well. Uh, so since 1996, we have had 100% uh, of our territories allocated to um, oil companies. They don't have operations on our territories yet, but that is because we have deployed those strategies to defend our territories as a full-time job. But that's just one of the threats. So, of course, we also have threats of um, deforestation and, and other threats as well. In the north, our indigenous uh, neighbors in the north also face deforestation from uh, palm oil, illegal and legal mining, as well as uh, oil contamination. In the south, it's similar. So the experience is, of course, that the threats are getting closer and closer. And we have to support our fellow indigenous communities uh, and neighbors as well. But we often lack the resources to do so. Financial institutions and companies often say that they lack resources um, to deal with deforestation, for example. But the communities really lack the, the resources. And often we, we are not informed about the projects or the value chains. We don't get the information about the concessions. And we don't know who is importing the um, who is importing the commodities. So I think based on my experience on the ground, as well as working with financial institutions and companies, I think it's clear that any action to address deforestation must help and empower indigenous peoples and, of course, other communities that are um, affected by deforestation to defend their territories and their rights as well. And this includes um, the full participation of indigenous peoples at the negotiation at international policy level but also at company and financial institution level, as well as their policies. So as the Forest 500 report found, um, most financial institutions do not have those kinds of policies. But the reality on the ground for many indigenous peoples is that if they speak up, there is a risk of retaliation. So, and, and also we don't know who the, we don't know the, the value chain of, of, of the drivers of deforestation. So I think um, companies and financial institutions have an important role to play. And that the first step is, of course, recognizing indigenous people's rights, as well as developing effective grievance mechanisms um, so that indigenous peoples can make the, those complaints to you as a financial institution if you are connected or financing um, projects or, or companies that are causing deforestation and causing human rights abuses. Emil, thank you, thank you very much for that. And I, it's, it's quite striking how I think there's been an improvement in representation of the indigenous voices at certainly the climate cops. Uh, I was at COP27, I, I wasn't at COP15, but I, I think I saw from reporting of that a, a, a marked improvement in indigenous representation, but that needs to be reflected as you're saying in the financial world as well. And that would be a very welcome and important development. So. So thank you for that, Emil. So let's turn to the kind of world of, of business, if you like. So Eva, you're going to talk us through really how the, the business perspective on this. I mean, you've been uh, working through your organization to try to encourage businesses to, to understand nature risks, to, to really evaluate them and, and adapt their policies accordingly. But what, what's your response, Eva, to, to, to what we're hearing from the report and, and whether the kinds of measures that are being discussed, for example, at COP15, the Global Biodiversity Framework, does that go far enough? Thanks so much, David. Great to be here. Thanks to Global Canopy. And, you know, the, the reality on the ground that we were just hearing from ML, it, that's what resonates with each and every one of us as individuals. And I think we need to really embed that in the decisions we make, whether we're in a company or financial institution or in our own families. So in a way, I feel like we should be giving more time to Emil right now. <laughs> but anyway, it's hard to take sort of a big step back, a uh, broader view and look at global policy. But actually, global policy has the potential to then trickle down and if it is correctly implemented. So as you just mentioned, 
we now have a global biodiversity framework, Paris equivalent, Paris Agreement equivalent for nature. And it really was a historic agreement in December, adopted by 196 countries at the CBD COP15. And it's put a spotlight on the level of ambition and action that's needed to address the biodiversity crisis. I also understand from colleagues in the indigenous communities that they are welcoming the global biodiversity framework that has a greater emphasis on the rights of indigenous communities. And don't forget that 2022 was also the year that the UN adopted a new human right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. Um, but as also, so, so we have a lot of these agreements now. The real trick is how do we implement it? Now is where the, the credibility and the success of any agreement can only be in whether the targets have been achieved. So in the global biodiversity, there are 23 targets. You'll be pleased to know I'm not going to go through them all. Um, but what is ex really exceptional is they all fit into an overall mission that all parts of society must be contributing to, which is to halt and reverse biodiversity mm -hmm. loss by 2030 meaning it represents a real step towards securing a nature positive future by 2030. One of the targets that I'll focus on focuses on the role of business and finance. It's called target 15. And it really is a reaction to the fact that we can't rely on voluntary action. We simply cannot rely on voluntary action anymore. We need regulation and mandatory requirements. And in the Global Biodiversity Framework Target 15, it's the first time in a multilateral agreement that governments have explicitly committed to require all large companies and financial institutions to assess and disclose their risks, impacts, and dependencies on nature through their operations, supply chain, and value chains and portfolios. Now, what's exceptional is that in the run up to COP15, collectively, we managed to secure 400 companies and financial institutions to ask governments to make it mandatory for them to do that, to level the playing field. And this report that we're discussing today is absolutely part of that radical need for transparency. Now, the companies need to report on their impacts and dependencies, but also you'll notice this risks. And I think that's an element that helps be a hook for the exchanges in the companies and financial institutions <laughs> to understand why they are so material. So we need to celebrate the success of a strong global biodiversity framework, and we must all feel responsible for contributing to its successful implementation. I'll add just one quick thing is that that next level of implementation at a national level um, is already happening. So the EU and the United Kingdom have already expressed that they're working towards mandatory disclosure. They interpret Target 15 as meaning mandatory disclosure and assessment. And we can expect other governments to follow those, both those markets, policymakers are already looking at bringing in stronger laws on due diligence when it comes to deforestation. These are real signals that within companies and financial institutions will drive the scale of action that's necessary. So we need to strengthen our accountability system and we have methodologies, frameworks in place and coming that are harmonizing. And I'll just mention too, the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, TNFD, and the science-based targets for nature, they'll both play an essential risk, uh, role in this risk assessment to make better informed decisions. Thanks. Thank you, Eva. So the pressures are building, the mechanisms are, are coming into play that'll make it harder uh, to, as Nikki said, hide, hide with the pack. Um, but we, everyone's overrun, but everything's so fascinating. So that was bound to happen. And we want to allow as much time as possible for questions, but let, let me come back to each of you panelists for, for one quick thought. Now, I know Emma, part of the report includes recommendations. Now we're not gonna have time. I'm not gonna give you time to look through them all. Pick one. What is the most important recommendation in your view that would turn this year into a watershed moment that we also desperately need to see? 
financial institutions are particularly lagging behind. They are really two thirds almost don't have a policy. And so we really need them to move on deforestation now. They need to use the tools, the data, the guidance that's there, it's in the report, there's case studies, they need to move. And we need to, all of the companies and all of the financial institutions we assess need to recognize that deforestation is a risk to finance, it's a risk to business, and it's a risk to life. Thank you. Well, that's an admirably brief, concise, punchy answer. Uh, Emil, pick, if you would, one recommendation, one thing that would actually help this year turn the corner. I think the Forest 500 report has quite some clear recommendations, such as um, implementing the accountability framework. So I won't go into detail of that. Um, but just from my personal experience, um, without going into all the details and technical details of, of those frameworks, I think explicitly recognizing uh, indigenous people's rights and not just not just um, mentioning indigenous peoples, for example, but actually recognizing and committing to respect those rights throughout the value chain. Okay, well, that's a, that's really clear, and and that would be amazing to see that uh, that that happen. Eva, do you want to pick in the same vein one one thing that 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 would that would be pivotal that would really start to to make a big difference this year? I would say it's hard to choose, David. No, but no, you've got to. I'm, I'm asking. Companies, you so I would say one. the what companies absolutely have to now commit to and meet science-based targets for climate and nature um, to make sure we're operating within planetary boundaries and to disclose their impacts and dependencies to help everyone across the value chain and in society make better decisions. Okay, okay. Well, that's great. So th thank you uh, to our panelists for, for that. Now, we're getting actually a lot of great questions uh, from everybody taking part um, in this session. We won't have time to get to them all, but let me just pick out one or two. Uh, there's one really for, for you, Emma. Uh, which commodities does the Forest 500 report cover? I think you've mentioned some of them and, and why? Why did you pick those? The Forest 500 focuses on tropical deforestation and specifically driven by palm oil, soy, beef, leather, timber, and pulp and paper, because those six commodities collectively drive two thirds of tropical deforestation you know, there are lots of other commodities that do drive deforestation on a smaller scale that are perhaps more significant in specific places, but globally it is about those it's those six that drive most. So that's why we focus on those six. And and if you rank them there in that list you've just given in those six by order of impact. So interestingly, what we see is a lot of companies score really well for palm oil. They have strong policies but disproportionately less for beef and soy, even though they are now the biggest drivers of tropical deforestation. So we really need to see much more focus and effort on those commodities. Got it, got it. Um, so another one, which is a great one really for Emil, I mean, in all the discussion about ESG, and there's a million questions really about ESG and the definition and what it means and is it valuable and so forth. But I mean, in all the discussion about ESG and sustainable Finance in a in a in a sort of broader sense, is the indigenous people's rights angle being missed here? Do you think in in all of those discussions? Um, I would say human rights in general, but um, I think it's 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 become increasingly um, more adopted by companies. Human rights indigenous process, um, but in terms of indigenous rights, I think it's. I mean, it's it's easy to talk about indigenous rights in a in a policy, but actually understanding the situation of the people on the ground and and listening to them and making sure that their voices are taken into account, um, I think that's missing. And that includes also asking uh, what tools or what information do indigenous peoples need. So, for example, we often talk about the data needs of investors or companies, but as was as I was mentioning before, indigenous peoples on the ground as well as other uh, communities, they don't know about who, what companies are operating on, on, on their territories. Who are the investors that are financing those uh, companies? Who are the companies that are buying those uh, commodities? So I think just rethinking, of, I mean, of course we have to focus on companies and investors, but also thinking of what do people on the ground need to be able to uh, hold deforestation and to have that agency as well. 
So j just a question, Emil, did, but that information, which is so key, is that more readily available now in terms of, I mean, are these actors, these players doing the deforest, are they more visible now to you? Um, it, it's probably depends on on the region, so I can't speak for all regions. But just based on my experience of trying to find um, and investigate companies in Ecuador, I mean it's it's really difficult. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's readily available currently. Right, right. So that's still a problem with with actually just getting hold of the right the right information. Um, Glad to see questions are, 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 are piling in here. I mean, this is really for you, Eva. To, to what extent is it important for, for consumers to change their consumption patterns? I mean, the focus of this report is obviously companies and financial institutions, but to what extent does it does this question actually revert to all of us as individual with individuals with wallets and purses and, and making purchasing choices every hour? Well, absolutely. Um, I would say that, in fact, we all have a role to play in the overall accountability of the system in which we operate, whether as consumers, as voters, um, as businesses, financial institutions, as lawyers, as artists, as grassroots organizations, each and every one of us, and of course, policymakers. So consumers obviously can play a role in influencing, and but the influence to date, even though it's increasingly more sustainable and sending sub signals, for example, to companies around meat based products going to more vegetarian options, that shift is real. But it's still not enough. And we also need to recognize that we're dealing with multiple crises right now, cost of living. If people can't afford um, any way to buy food, they're not going to pay a premium for a sustainable option. And so essentially what we need to do is embed the true value of impacts and dependencies on nature into our whole economic system. Now that sounds huge, but it is possible because then the true value of what we would buy would be would make the most sustainable option actually the cheapest. Um, and a key element of that that we haven't touched upon today, uh, environmentally harmful subsidies, which completely distort the markets in which we operate. So answer is for the consumers, you know, overall we should each be reducing, well, not each, those of us with a high environmental footprint should be reducing by at least half our consumption. So just keep that in mind in everyday life, how you could reduce by about half. Which I guess is in line with the IPCC recommendation to cut global emissions by 45% by 2030. It's kind of a, a, a parallel there, I guess. So thank you for that. Um, now this is a really key uh, topic that's come up now. Um, and I guess it's really for, for Emma, but perhaps also Nikki, and might be good to hear your take on the extent to which in the course of this process of Forest 500, you engaged with companies and financial institutions um, can they approach you for guidance? Um, how open is the door? Is it a is it a two way process? Um, so if as I know there are there are many people from the asset management and banking worlds on this uh, webinar uh, who may be wondering, well, it's all very well beating us up, but where do we go from here? Perhaps Nikki, you want to pick that up? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, and I mean, let's come to Emma too, because Emma talks to so many of these companies and financial institutions, and the message is clear. The door is more than open, wide open. We're absolutely delighted to talk to and support companies and financial institutions who are looking to move forward. We've developed with that aim. We've developed guidance, particularly for financial institutions, five-part we hope clear guidance on best practice and how to move forward in a very practical way, not in a theoretical way. We haven't done that for corporates because there's already fantastic guidance on corporate risk from the accountability framework initiative. So please take a look at them. Brilliant work by, by them. We've got finance sector guidance. And yes, we are here to talk um, with those companies and financial institutions that wish to, um, of course, you know, capacity allowing. Um, 
and also just to call out, I mean, in, at Glasgow at COP26, there were some very striking and you know brave commitments by a group of financial institutions to go deforestation free in their portfolios by 2025. So we've been working to support that effort and we've seen some real progress there. So there are some bright spots, but you know, overall, yes, please do contact us. Emma, I don't know any anything to add to yeah. that. Emma, just give us a quick comment on that because I think it's a really key point here. Our assessments are based on publicly available information, but we get in touch with financial institutions and companies at the beginning of the process with methodology webinars this year. We get in touch, we got in touch a week before launch and we got in touch today. So if any companies and financial institutions are on the call and you have questions, you want to find out more, please do get in touch at the email that has just been put in the chat. Thank you. That's that's really clear. Look, I'm I'm really sorry to to everybody who's who's put in a great question and we haven't had a chance to get to you. We're we're really into the last kind of minute here. Um, I think there is a slide with all the email addresses for follow up and all the rest of it. Perhaps we can come to that in a sec. But I think we need to just wrap this up now. So thank you to everybody for taking part. All of the people from around the world, the 251 of you. It's been great to be part of such an amazing event. Many, many thanks to our panelists, uh, Emma, Evie, and uh, Emil, for your perspectives, extremely valuable on this. Thank you to the authors uh, of a great piece of work. Um, so let's bring up this final slide, if we can, and Chris has got the email addresses for how to get the report, how to follow up with Forest 500. If you're a member of the media, uh, the press uh, email address there. As you sign off, there will be a very short survey, which uh, these things are sometimes a pain, but they're incredibly useful for the organizers. So um, do just take a few minutes to do that. It just leaves me to, 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 to thank you all for taking part. And let's just hope that if we do this again in a year's time, the results will be an awful lot better. But many, many thanks wherever you are.